Okay, hello. Now, it's me again, Mr. Edwards, episode five. Or is it episode four? It's episode five. It's episode five. I can remember how everything happens so quickly these days, doesn't it? Or does it? We're all stuck at home still. Uh, what's been happening this week? Well, uh, this is the week when uh, Joe Biden's been <laughs> signing quite a lot of executive orders, which uh, I suppose is quite encouraging. We've had some very, very good news about various vaccines and vaccines to come. Unfortunately, the EU hasn't been uh, terribly well organised. Uh, Arlene Foster uh, thinks that uh, the EU is attacking her country by stealing her vaccines. It just occurred to me, um, have you noticed that, I would look this up, have you noticed how similar Arlene Foster looks to Ronnie Barker in the Plumstead Ladies Male Voice Choir in The Two Ronnies? I would look that up, I think you'd be amazed. Now, what are we going to do this week? Well, I thought a long time about this. Um, I want to uh, cook the, one of the last of the recipes that's already on Firefly for you. And on Firefly, it is called something like pork with a, a creamy mushroom sauce. Now, this is this, partly the same principle as making chicken tarragon. Uh, it's uh, produced in a similar way. It's very quick. And I wanted to show it to you because not only is it one of our favourites, but it's also like chicken tarragon, like risotto, like carbonara. It's really adaptable and very easy to do. This happens to be quite quick once you've done the initial preparation. There are lots of dishes like this over the world. Uh, I suppose the most famous one, the one that inspired me to, to sort of start cooking it and making a, a version of my own, is something called a Geschnetzeltes Zürcher Art or something like that, which means thin slices of veal in the Zurich fashion. And that's a sort of, uh, a sort of creamy mushroom sauce. Now, what we're doing here is not quite that, but it's the same, yeah, it's, just, it's inspired by that. What I have in my fantastic sort of selection of ingredients here, which you can see on the GoPro, uh, is some uh, pork. So this is pork fillet. What I've done is I've, I'm not taking too much. This is for three people. It's about, I would say, 280, 300 grams. That's not a lot. But the thing is you have other ingredients as well. So you don't need to have a massive amount of pork per person. And that's a good principle to follow if you're making dishes like this. Here is my beautiful fillet of pork. I have washed my hands. Uh, and uh, I have cut it into sort of these uh, medallions, I, I would call those, but they're quite thin. Now, why have I done that? The reason is that I want to cook them very quickly. If I cook them very quickly, they will remain moist and juice in, juicy inside. Now, what are the other ingredients of this dish? Uh, I'm using a red onion. Very nice, we haven't used red onions in our recipes so far. Uh, there is a little bit of pancetta, which is, a, uh, as you know from the risotto and the uh, carbonara, a sort of uh, smoked bacon, okay, that is produced in Italy. I have garlic here, which again, you remember, you're not going to add in too early. And there is a little bit of sage. Here is sage. Now, guys, the sage is something that you hear a lot about. This is sage from the garden here in London, and uh, you don't need to use a lot of it. It's not as if you have to have a massive handful. It's very strong, so you've got to be rather careful. And last of all, I have some mushrooms. Uh, these are some of my favourites, which are pre-prepared, all ready to go there. Uh, they're called uh, Giron. Now, uh, Mike asked me what well, <laughs> well, that was in English. I have no idea. Uh, they call called Giron, as far as I'm concerned. They're a type of wild mushroom. Now, the way that we do this dish is that we prepare the sort of sauce base first. That's to say, the onions and the uh, pancetta uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the garlic at the end of that. Then we reserve that. We take it out of the pan, put it somewhere else and keep it. And then, when we're ready, or we're just thinking, ah, it's five minutes before we eat, then we're going to assemble it all and what we'll do is we will heat the pan to very high, sear, very quickly sear the pork on both sides. It won't take very long to cook because it's very thin and then we will add to that our uh, uh, pre-cooked mixture of onions and pancetta and mushrooms. We will add our garlic, we will add our sage, probably towards the end, 
a little bit of white wine, and then we will add cream and then it'll be done. Easy as pie and quick as a flash. So I'll heat up this and we'll get on with doing the first part. Now then, there's lots of creaky doors in this house, I'm convinced it's so. I'm convinced it's haunted. In fact, it is haunted. Somebody has actually just walked through the door. It's not a ghost, however. Uh, probably a bit worse than a ghost, actually. Now, it's a teenager. It's a teenager. <laughs> come on. Come Here we on. go. Come and say hello quickly. Come and say hello. Oh, you're not going to say hello. Okay, well, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on, Mrs. Francis. Come and say hello. There's the Cardinal Vaughan School. She's also a very good cook. Now, one week, what we're going to do is I'm not going to show you how to cook something, but Francis is, who can make her own pizza in its entirety. It's a great, great thing to be able to do. And of course, I know that all of you guys absolutely love pizza, but what you think you like, when you make it yourself, you'll like it twice as much. Right, Frankie? Yeah. Brilliant, you can go now. Thank you. Right. <laughs> okay, here we go. We've got our uh, onions going right here. Here we go, like that. As you can see, I'm sort of um, putting them in in sort of these strips. You don't have to do that. I think I said on a previous episode that we quite liked to keep things quite sort of rustic here. It's very comforting to sort of know the shape of the thing that you're you're eating. Do you know what I mean? There they are. Ah, already there's an absolutely fantastic smell that's coming up from that. One of the things I've always wondered about, it's a very good sign of how, what people do in their kitchen, is to look at the, the wooden things um, that they cook with. You know you're in a really good kitchen when you get things like this. Wooden tongs, that's a very, very useful sort of implement because you can put it into a hot saucepan and pick things up and just check things. Here we are. And of course, because it's wood, it won't damage the bottom of the, uh, you know, what, in this pan, for example, it, that is quite a valuable pan, this sort of uh, Teflon coated. What's it called? It's, um, it's uh, those things from, Le, like those things from Le Creuset, isn't it? Uh, anodized. Uh, anodized, Sa I think. Yeah. Right. John Lewis, very good. <laughs> I so, can't guarantee. <laughs> You see, that, what does a lifetime guarantee actually mean? You're going to see this on lots of things that you buy, guys. You know, it, this thing has a lifetime guarantee. Whose lifetime? Your lifetime? That's, if it's guaranteed for its lifetime, that could be like three minutes, couldn't it? Yeah, especially with the way you use a knife on that. My knife? Fine, I'm not using a knife. Yeah, previous episodes, I think you'll find. Oh dear. Oh, gentlemen, if you ever see me doing that, don't do it at home. Or mum and dad will not be happy with you. Now, guys, what we want here is, it's on, this is on quite high, I think I'll probably better switch it down a little bit. We don't want this onion to burn. We want to just make it soft. If it gets a little cold, that's fine. But what you don't want to do is just to leave it there and walk off. And as I said in the other week, go and get yourself a coke or phone a girlfriend or whatever, because it's going to burn and the onion will then taste very bitter. So keep moving it around. Or if you're more patient than I am, cook it quite slowly. Now what's happening, as you, as you probably can't see just by looking at it, is that the, it's getting a little bit softer. Yeah, a little bit softer like this. Well, I think it's about time now that we can add our, our bits of uh, pancetta. Pancetta is a bacon that's rolled. So it, when you buy it, as, it looks like a massive sausage. You buy it and it's very thinly sliced. It's uh, cured in a particularly Italian sort of style and smoke is really 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 good and it'll, it'll impart a smokiness to it I think you can put it in um, this is quite a lean pancetta it's not actually it's not the one that I normally go for I prefer things with a bit more of a fat content now that's not because I'm fat that's because the fat in a meat is the thing that gives all the flavor you remember one of Mr. Edwards's life skills the other week was trying different foods and we had a whole beautiful shoulder of Iberico ham and it's the fat content that makes it valuable not the meat content so think about that you know next time you're you're cooking and you remember that when you do carbonara of course it is the fat content of the bacon that provides the amazing taste of the carbonara 
Now, several of you have sent in your pictures of your cooking. Fantastic. I had some great ones from the McNairs. I had some great ones from Bruno Myers. I had great ones from all sorts of fantastic people. Well done. Keep doing that. You know that there's another photography competition, which I helped uh, Mr. Dominic Price to judge the other night. I have to say, I'm not a photographer, but looking at the quality of the photos that came out, I was absolutely astounded. Some of them were very, very well made, very clever and very artistic and thought about. And that's a great thing. Another example of people taking up a new interest. All right, now I'm gonna rely on Claire and Mike here to <laughs> tell me, guys, how does that smell? Oh, very good. Fantastic. <laughs> it, does, it, it does smell amazing. Here I am, I'm gonna put in the, um, the mushrooms, about time here. Looking all right. I think I might reserve my uh, sage to the end, although it's tempting to put it in now. As you can see, I've got a little bit of white wine here. I'm going to put a little bit in now, okay? Because what I don't want is for, for it to dry up and start crisping up and burning and becoming bitter. So we're going to let that sort of bubble away for a bit. And when we're happy with what it's doing, we'll take it all out of the pan, put it somewhere, uh, probably on this plate, and we'll have a little intermission whilst you can learn some more of um, Mr. E's life skills. And when we're ready uh, to sort of plate up, we'll flash from the pork, add that, add a little bit more wine, some cream, okay, and then we'll be done. At this point here, I reckon it's not a bad idea to add the garlic, okay? You could add it a bit later, depends on how strong you like your dish. What's great about adding it now is that because there's a little bit of liquid with the wine in the pan, the garlic won't burn. It'll simply sort of infuse the taste. If you like garlic a little bit less than I do, firstly, A, add less, or don't add it. It doesn't really matter. Remember, you're cooking for yourself and your family. You need to cook the things that you like to eat. Okay, if you absolutely hate garlic, just don't cook with garlic. Now, that smell is something else. <laughs> Let's hope it carries on like that. You never know, it could all go be a complete disaster. You know, I remember I was saying at the beginning um, that uh, this, uh, one, of, one derivative of this dish, you know, uh, this sort of veal in the Zurich style, Zucker art, you know, with the, the, a, a mushroom sauce. That's, I mean, an absolutely superb, superb thing to order when you're in, uh, in Switzerland. Always traditionally accompanied by a rusty. There is a recipe for a rusty on the Firefly. And uh, I would recommend that you try it. There are lots of different recipes for rusty. So I think, you know, I've tried one uh, that it worked well. I've tried another last week, actually, and it didn't work well. Now, you really do need to ask your mum and dad to help you here because this could go all wrong. Here we go, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna press down, I'm gonna go like that. And hopefully, it'll just come away. Which, largely speaking, it has. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cut there. <laughs> I think the one on the uh, website will be okay, but I would recommend that you make it in smaller portions, okay? So this is what we're gonna have tonight to accompany it, a little small rusty. It's quite tricky to make a big one. So a little small one like that uh, would be a perfect accompaniment to this. Now at the end, I've said here today that I'm adding in sage and the reason that we're doing that is because this is what we have in the garden. I would recommend that um, at the end you probably add some parsley. If you don't happen to have parsley today, it doesn't matter. Sage goes really well with these sorts of ingredients, with pork, with bacon, with mushrooms. Right, there we go. So that, I think, is about ready to take out of the pan and reserve on a plate, okay? Which is what I'm going to do right now. Okay, I'm turning my back to the camera. I realise I apologise. It's looking good. I think the red onions are a nice touch in this. Remember, it doesn't have to be a red onion. It could be any sort of onion. You don't even need to add onions at all. These dishes are adaptable to your own tastes and 
to be frank, <laughs> what you've got in the kitchen. And I think on that note, what we'll do is we will take a short intermission during which you are going to watch another life skill from Mr. E. See you a bit later. So welcome to another episode of Life Skills and you should have known that it was Life Skills because we started with a close-up shot of a smelly French cheese. That in fact is the smelly French cheese that I was introducing you to last week. Now it's in lockdown and you promised that you were going to try some new things. So today what are we going to talk about? Well it's not cheese although it's just about two meters away from me. It's very very tempting to go and gobble it all up right now. Now today we're going to talk about something that I am sure that most of you have already been doing. That's laying the table. It's quite an interesting art, laying the table. There's some very fascinating facts and history behind how you do it and how it differs in various countries. Um, I know that you will all have done this at home and that you've been helping out and you've been clearing the table. I just thought it might be quite interesting to give you a little bit more detail about uh, how to lay a table uh, and where to put knives and forks and for what reason. It's quite an interesting thing. So here we go. Uh, as you know, uh, my household is sort of a little bit French and a little bit English. So there are two different ways of laying the table in France and in England. Uh, they're both subtly different. Let's start uh, with the English way that you might be used to. So here we are. This is what you might expect to see. Now, I promise you, we don't always have seven course meals here. I've just laid out a lot of cutlery to show what the cutlery is and what order you put it in. The essential um, thing to start off with in your mind, if you go to the, one of these fancy dinners uh, in an Oxford college or a Cambridge college, if they have such things, um, is that you start at the outside of the cutlery and you work your way in. The cutlery should be arranged according to the dishes that you're eating course by course by course by course. It doesn't have to be many courses, but sometimes I've been to some where, where you've had this much cutlery. Now, let me explain what's going on here. On the outside is the cutlery that you use for the first dish that you eat. So in England, that means the starter. And here we have a smaller knife and a smaller uh, fork like that, uh, that you would use to eat whatever the starter may be, okay? Now, if there was a fish, uh, a soup course, I beg your pardon, that followed, that, then you would start to pick up your soup spoon right here. A soup spoon, traditionally, actually is not that shape. But it's quite interesting how that has evolved. That it's evolved purely to distinguish it from the dessert spoon, which it sort of normally would have resembled. Then you might have a course of fish. And fish cutlery is very interesting. It's made to look rather different. Here they are, look at these things here. Rather delicate, don't you think? Rather delicate. There's a little, a little dimple in the fork right there to indicate that it is a fish fork. The fork, as you can see, is not designed for sawing and cutting. It's designed for separating away the flakes of fish from the fillet, like this. Then you'll see we have a larger a knife and a larger fork. This would be for your main course, okay? And by this time, you're probably not feeling very hungry. <laughs> now, what would happen next? Now, in England, you probably would have dessert. Uh, and the dessert cutlery would be above your plate uh, with the spoon pointing to the left and the fork to the right. Although this has been hotly debated. I think that it's like this, but maybe in your house you do it differently. And traditionally in, in the UK, you finish off your meal with something savoury, normally cheese. Now, I, I will tell you now, I am not sure where the cheese knife would go. I'm assuming it would be the last knife, slightly smaller knife, that's a very, sort of, very small cheese knife there, uh, would be the last thing that you picked up. Now. You don't lay everything out like that if you're not eating fish or you're not having a starter or you're not having soup. You only lay out the cutlery that you need. Although it has to be admitted, it does look quite good when it's all laid out like that, doesn't it? Your napkin in, in uh, the UK, in New Britain, should traditionally be on a plate on the left. That's what we do here. 
And uh, well, here, because of course we reuse our napkins from meal to meal, we have things called a napkin ring. Now these belonged to Mike's parents, okay, and there is a, a J for Yannicka, I believe, uh, on there, so that we would know who it belongs to. Uh, it used to be, napkin rings used to be the sorts of things you were given when you were born, weren't it? I was given, by your godmother and godfather, I was given a, a, a pair of silver napkin rings by my godfathers when I was born. Now there's also, at a meal, uh, this is for the ladies and gents principally, who <laughs> know all this already probably, uh, a selection of glasses. Uh, always a water glass. Now we, we ha we're very lucky, we happen to use <laughs> a water glass that is like this. It's not the usual sort of shape, but it is a very, very beautiful glass. It's hand blown in, in, in Venetian glass, uh, in, made in Murano. So we use those because they look nice and they've got a sort of blue tint, which sort of suggests water. But sometimes it would be a tumbler or something like that. And then you would have probably two glasses of different sizes. Okay, the larger one would always be for red wine and the slightly smaller one would be for white wine. And of course they can be any sorts of glasses that you like. But let's sort of go through this. Um, you can see it looks a little bit the same. It isn't. To start with, in France, if there was a soup, it would normally be the first thing that you ate. And that's why the soup spoon, which in France normally is a slightly larger sort of spoon like that, would be on the outside on the right. Then you would have, if you were going to have a starter, an hors d'oeuvre, as you might call it, or une entrée, then you would have the knife and the fork that were required for that. Then there would be fish, okay, just now it's starting to resemble a bit more the English style, and then a main course. And as I said before, it doesn't need to be absolutely every single one of those. Here is where it starts to get a bit different. In France, you don't really not have things that are, are side plates. You would ha perhaps have a plate pour le pain, the bread. In a French meal, anywhere, a, a French meal in France, as opposed to a meal that is an Italian meal or a, a, a something, a, a curry or something, but at a French restaurant or at a French meal, you would always be offered bread. That's part of what you either pay for or just what people do. There is always, always bread on the table. Now, sometimes people will lay out a small plate for you to put your bread on, and it would be in this position here, not here, up here. Most of the time, people don't. They simply put it on the tablecloth uh, or on the side of the plate or something like that. Quite interesting, though. The glasses you'll see are in a separate position. They're in the same order, always the water on the left, then the red wine, then the white wine, but they're straight in front of the person. And here's the other essential difference. Anything that you eat after the main courses will be above the plate, including the cheese knife. And in France, as you probably know, if you've been listening carefully to Mr. Lagden's lessons, uh, the cheese is always eaten before the pudding. Now that's got something to do with the way that the French palate works, they prefer to end with something sweet as opposed to something savoury. So, there we are. Um, a good meal, of course, would not start with a nipoise, as this little bit of your life skills has just done. I had to put it out there, because this is definitely my favourite cheese. Oh, gracious. That's really, really quite pungent, but so creamy and full flavour. But you might start with champagne or something like that. Uh, in, the French happen to like port as an aperitif, not as something that you always have with Stilton. You know, it's quite a difference of uh, cultures. But it's interesting, isn't it, that there are both similarities and differences in the way the tables are formally laid. And, and I just thought you might want to experiment a little bit. So when uh, lockdown finishes and when we're able to see people again and have people over, I'm sure that you'll all be keen to have uh, people over for dinner and people over for lunch and parties and see your grandparents and things like this. And there might be a big family reunion that you could help out at. Now, if there was a family reunion at my house, I, that is the day that I absolutely love because I love organising these things and I would lay the table and put all the cutlery in the right way. I'd even try to remember who is left-handed and swap it all around, okay? So you've got a chance here just to sort of learn a little bit extra about how to lay a table. 
it's not simply always fork on the left, knife on the right, spoon on the top. You can do it other ways. And that's your life lesson for the uh, week this week. Oh, welcome back. How did you enjoy the intermission? Have you learned a new life skill? Has it inspired you to try something? And if it has, excellent. And if it hasn't, watch it again and uh, get going. Now, you remember, we're on to our little uh, beautiful pork dish here. Here is the pork fillet. Uh, and here is the mixture of the bacon, the onion, uh, the beautiful giard mushroom, you use any sort of mushroom, of course, uh, and the garlic, which we're gonna add right at the end. What we need to do now is the last stage of the dish. We're going to fry the pork in a very hot pan. Right here I have preheated my pan. Okay, I don't need too much oil. I just need enough to cut the butter not to burn too much. You can see it's uh, really sizzling up there and that's what you want. Okay. You can sort of tell that it's ready to go almost by the sound of it actually. So here I am, I've pre-seasoned my pork, in it goes. You, know, you don't need to put too, too, oops, too much per person, because remember you've got other things to add to it as well. All right. There we go. Now it's important that you cook pork through um, in some you know fancy places you might eat pork that is a bit pink in the middle uh, which is fine it's very nice like that but uh, if you're cooking at home I think you need to be a bit careful uh, to make sure you do cook it all the way through uh, and this is where you may need to ask mum or dad or whoever's helping you out here just to check that it's okay all right now, the smell is of the butter, it's browning a little bit, it's really delicious. Now, it's, as you can see here, it's not quite brown enough. What you want is to achieve a little bit of caramelization on the underside, that's just with, with golden bits, all right? I reckon that when we turn this over, what we'll do is we'll add the sage, which I chopped, okay, in the intermission whilst you were watching uh, my life skills uh, uh, bit. I've chopped this up and we'll be able to add that at some suitable moment. Now, there you see there's a little bit of browning going on there, and I think that's a good moment to turn them all over. Yeah, there's just a little bit of browning. You can do this dish, by the way, you know, it doesn't have to be a full. Um, if I was at home in France, we'd be doing it with veal, right, which is very easy to get where I live, um, or chicken, or Rabbit, even you know, rabbit's delicious. You might not think that you wanted to eat one of your fluffy friends, but they are rather tasty. I'm going to put on my uh, my sage here. The advantage of putting it there here at this point here is it gets to sort of fry a little bit and it'll sort of uh, develop its aroma. Uh, so I think it's now about time that we add the rest of our mixture right here. This can just sort of go straight in like that. And you sort of distribute it around. Now, we need to think a little bit about seasoning. I'm gonna be a little, a tad, I'm gonna be careful with the amount of salt because I did pre-season the pork with a little bit of salt. And also this bacon here is quite salty anyway. So just be careful with that. Remember, you mustn't have too much salt in your diet. It's not very really good for your, for your veins and arteries and things. Pepper, plenty of this. A, la, a tad, a little bit of wine, okay? Just to sort of bring up the, the flavor. We already added some to our previous dish, so you don't have to add a lot. A couple of splashes, I would say. If you wanted to know how much that was, probably about that much of a wine glass, very small amount. And what we do now is we're gonna wait for it to um, bubble down a little bit. And doing that will enable all of the flavors in there to sort of come together. It will enable the rest of the pork to be cooked and uh, it will sort of do very well. 
And when the liquid has reduced down, very important word that, as it reduces, the flavour concentrates itself. And at that point, we'll add in the cream. Now, what I've got here is a, a sort of funny sort of mixture of sour cream and double cream. That's because we happen to have sour cream and double cream, and I wanted to save some double cream for the pudding. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what you use. Sour cream is, you know, crème fraîche is what the something what, what the Russians might use in a, a dish called stroganoff, which is very very similar to this. Uh, you know, uh, double cream is what you might use somewhere else. It doesn't really matter. Now, as you can see there, there's still quite a bit of liquid left in there, so I'm going to leave it for a bit longer. Okay, until there's not too much liquid, and the flavour in that liquid is that is thus super duper concentrated okay and then I will add the cream and it'll bubble away beautifully and that's not a word I just made it up uh, and it'll become super unctuous and um, yummy and delicious uh, and that'll be it one more thing whenever you cook anything like this uh, for example you know, the chicken tarragon or something even a risotto just let it be before you eat, once you've finished the cooking, just let it be for a bit. Five minutes, three minutes. If it was a roast, which I'm going to show you in a, in a future episode, 10, 15, it's a roast lamb, 30, just let it be because it needs to relax. And that means that, you know, when the, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the juices in the meat, which are sort of forced outwards when you apply heat, they will come back towards the center and that the meat will be much more sort of. Um, uh, tender and juicy. That's getting a little bit more towards what we really want guys. Down here, look at that. A little bit of liquid. Okay, remember we're being careful to cook the pork through. Alright, just got to be careful about these things. It's still a little bit too liquidy. Perhaps, um, I don't know what you think, perhaps I, add, I added a bit too much wine. Maybe there was already liquid in, in what I had put in with this mixture here. Again, you know, you live and you learn. You, you, you might make a mistake the first time. It doesn't need to stop you trying it for a second time. Okay. Now there, I think this is getting towards the time when I can add the cream because I can sense that the, the juices at the bottom of the pan here are becoming a little thicker. So I'm going to add this now. There we are. I'm going to put it all in. It's, uh, it's not too much. That's sort of half a medium sized pot. I mean, not a huge amount. If you want re recipe details, you can, you can always look at what I've written on the on the on the web page. A lot of the time, as as um, you know, your your parents or or, or your, your grandparents or whoever loves cooking in your family will tell you, you don't follow a recipe as such. You use it as the start of a an experience. And when you get experience at cooking that particular dish, it's, you sort of take it over in your own way and you, and you do what you want. And you sort of know by instinct when it's the right time to do one thing or another and how much to use. I remember my grandmother telling my uncle how to cook a particular French dish that she was you know, an expert in. It was actually beef tongue. And she would never ever give an amount of a recipe. That wasn't... 50 grams of this or 100 grams of that or a kilo of this it was just oh, a sort of handful or uh, oh quite a lot or oh, oh yeah I think a goodly amount but never ever was there a, a figure or a digit of anything you do it by instinct and that's what I think that's what real cooking is all about real home cooking there we are in there you can see bubbling away it smells good guys what smell describe the smell Mm. It's rich, rich. Mm. I'm afraid a lot of my cooking is slightly rich and possibly only to be had once a week. Um, but in another episode, I have got it in mind to teach you to cook some vegetables in, in a rather sort of nice way. Okay, that's about it. I'm going to add a bit more pepper. There we go. I'm not going to add any more salt. I'm not going to add any more wine because it's uh, it's had enough wine. It'll thicken up in a minute, and then we will leave it, and it will be ready to eat. Leave it for maybe five minutes, and then it'll be ready. 
Uh, again, it goes very well with Rusty, which we're going to have. Uh, at home, when I cook this with me and my mum, or a version of this, we have we normally have it with rice. The rice is quite good at absorbing all that yummy sauce there as well. So, very soon it will be half term. You haven't got very long. Just one more week after you've seen this. And uh, we'll have a little time to reflect on how it's going. The situation changes ever so quickly, doesn't it? And all the rules and the regulations about going here and going there and travelling abroad or coming back from abroad or who's going back to school. You know, I think what I've learned from it is that um, you simply, you've got, to, you've got to support people and go and follow the rules, but you've also got to make the very best of the situation that you're in. And I think this is why I'm really keen that you try out different activities. And I know that I bang on at this at you about this every week, and I bang on in my PCHE lessons with you. But I think we've got to make the most of the situations we find ourselves in, and that's how we learn. That I think is enough. So off goes the ring. I'm just going to pull that over there. We're going to leave that, guys, for five minutes now. Just sort of sit on its own, mind its own business, relax, and then it'll be ready. And served with a rusty, that is a real taste of the Alps. Absolutely delicious, very easy to make. Same principles as the other dishes. Now, you know the drill now. Carry on getting yourself away from your screen whenever you can. Take exercise, take up some new interests. Look after your family and keep yourself safe. See you next time.